Okay, can you guys all see it? So I just wanted to start out saying I am not a scientist, but I was raised with a really traditional family. We would go out and gather, hunt, fish, all that. Um, my grandmother, Leona, I'm sure you've all heard of Cheryl Seidner, my aunt, and she taught me a lot and told me stories about their family. And there's a good photo. And I found this photo of Firm Bridge in the Eel River in 1915. And you can see how high the water was back then. And this was before all the dams were there. There's another photo. I couldn't find when this was. And this is another photo I found for taking a couple of years ago at Firm Bridge also during our big drought. There's no water. And as Katja said, the Scotts Dam was built in 1922, Cape Horn Dam was built in 1908. And historical records suggest that the Chinook salmon runs were about 100,000 to 800,000 fish per year. And the first half of the 20th century, the runs were only about 50,000 to 100,000. And I wanted to use this as an example, the San Clement Dam on the Carmel River between the Big Sur Hills and the beachfront of the town of Carmel. This was the first dam removal project in California history. This one was built in 1921 and they removed it in 2016. And the fish are already returning. In 2016, there was none of them have returned, but there was a few, I think there was like 16 returned for the next year. And so far there's 123 still had that have traveled up river. With the salmon, humans are not the only animals that benefit from the salmon. And when the fish die, they decompose in the water and eat them. And when they're up, going upstream on the river after they spawn and they die, lots of scavengers, bear, raccoons, foxes, seals, um, waterfowl, and they eat the carcasses also. And there's studies that have shown there's a lot of marine nitrogen that could be found in the feathers of the birds. And salmon is very important to everybody around here. It is a staple for all the tribes. And the tribes take what we need and we don't waste anything. We'll use everything. And if we don't, we give it back to the earth. We give things, there are ceremonies and we don't waste. We don't catch them just to sell it and make money as much money as we can. My aunt Cheryl told me a story she cannot remember where she found it, where it came from, but she vaguely remembers it. The salmon ceremony in the spring, the tribes would place the salmon in a pit with leaves and cook it. And when the fish is almost done, they have a runner run it up into the mountains and to finish the cooking and they leave it there. And that is their way of giving thanks and to end my presentation, um, the return of the salmon would greatly benefit everybody in California, animals, humans, everything. The removing the dams after several generations, when we can bring the, we can help the river heal and prosper. Not just the tribes and commercial fishing, but it would meet a healthier ecosystem in animals around the waterways. And we wouldn't have all that black, the, algae blooms, the toxic algae, the everything like that. Um, the way the river is deteriorating is causing experts to hypothesize extinction of some of the salmon species within 50 years. And I also wanted to say that um, I'm working with the tribe this summer and with last summer and we are doing uh, pike minnow suppression to try to find out why lots of the salmonoids are not prospering in the river and I'm trying to find a way to help the minnows. So that is it. The photo I found. Thank you very much. Um, 
we're we're excited to be able to offer some time at the end just if everybody uh, knows for questions and so we'll be able to follow up on a number of the issues that people introduce and it'll be an opportunity to kind of engage with some of the tribes that are really doing this work on the watershed to learn more about why it is so important for them to be able to restore this not just as we're talking about for cultural purposes just in general so thank you much for that presentation and again if you have questions please bring the Q&A um, section to the bottom of your screen, click on Q&A, you should be able to enter in questions. Uh, our next pre presenter is Scott. He is from the Friends of the Eel River. And do you, I think know that um, he's going to put up, so I'm that up and then he can start with his presentation. Thanks, Kutra. Can you all hear me? Make sure you can hear me. Hmm. Yes. Thank okay. You. Good. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, and um, I want to apologize in advance for the uh, boringness of this presentation. It's um, been kind of a crowded week, and I wasn't able to get um, good illustrations in here. Um, I just want to start by saying how much I appreciate the chance to raise my kids in a place where. Um, indigenous cultures persist. Um, it's really important. And um, it's a great honor to be on a panel with somebody who was um, my daughter's classmate. Um, this gives me a lot of hope. Um, so thank you all for being here and for the work you're doing. Um, what I want to do today is just talk real quickly about where we are in a very, very complicated um, nest of agency processes and lay out um, what look like some of the most likely places we're going to be going from here. Um, and I, I want to start with um, not the plan, but the two basin solution idea, which is something that was articulated by our congressman Jared Huffman, um, and gives us really a, um, the foundation on which all of this work is built. And uh, let me see if I can share, I'm doing a crummy job of sharing properly. Um, well, never mind. Go to uh, pottervalleyproject.org and you can see what I'm talking about there. Um, the, the point of the two basin solution is that we're in a place where um, there's no obvious way to get the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the agency in charge of relicensing the Potter Valley Project and its two dams, to fix the problems that the Potter Valley Project has created. But we saw an opportunity to um, pursue the potential for a real compromise um, between Russian River and Eel River interests that would rest on basically securing fish passage on the eel in exchange for securing a continued diversion to the Russian River. So that's the basic idea, the co-equal goals of um, the, the two basin solution. Um, the, the last several years have seen a very rapid series of events during which um, PG&E, which owns the dams, has first tried to relicense them, then abandoned that relicensing effort. And then, um, but, but in the middle of that, actually tried to auction off the whole project. Um, after PG&E abandoned the relicensing effort, um, following their um, burning down the town of Paradise and um, going bankrupt, three of the groups that have been at the core of the two basin solution talks and the ad hoc group that um, Jared Huffman convened came together to try to put together a, a bid to continue the relicensing project and pursue a real two basin solution. Those groups were Sonoma Water, the Sonoma, Water, Sonoma County Water Agency now called Sonoma Water, 
Caltrout, and the Mendocino County Inland, Inland Water and Power Commission. There's a lot more to say about the Inland Water and Power Commission. The most important thing is that it is constituted of a series of Mendocino County interests, including the Potter Valley Irrigation District. Um, Humboldt County later joined that group, and that group was explicitly founded um, with an invitation to the Round Valley Tribes to join it. That's the group that's now come forward with the feasibility study report that was filed in May, and that I'm gonna be talking about a little bit here. Um, comments on that report are going in right now. Um, they appear to be due Monday at the latest, but everybody seems to be treating it as Sunday, which is weird, but that's a different problem. Um, the basic idea of the feasibility study report is that we propose, this, this group proposes to remove Scott Dam, um, it proposes to do that by taking over the whole project, remove Scott Dam, fix the fish passage at Cape Horn, and continue the diversion in the wet season. So we're moving what has been a summer diversion to a wet season diversion. Um, the feasibility study report also proposes a pipeline to take water back from the Lake Mendocino Reservoir uphill to Potter Valley to supply their water needs. Um, there are some real problems with this plan. Um, in general, it's really easy to solve problems if you've got an unlimited amount of money. Um, of course, the, what looked like a budget surplus for the state last year now looks like a serious budget deficit. That's going to be much harder um, to raise money in that, that context. Um, as well, the, the feasibility study report doesn't yet define how we're going to solve the problem of fish passage at the Cape Horn Dam and the Van Arsdale Fish Ladder, which is the tallest and the longest fish ladder in California, and it's not one that works particularly well. Um, as well, we're concerned about who would control the regional entity. Um, we're particularly concerned that a regional entity be, could be set up and then basically run out of money and decide to keep Scott Dam in place. And I gotta say the um, overall dynamic for, throughout this um, series of negotiations has been that the water users of the Russian River, particularly Potter Valley, um, don't wanna pay. They've had free or very cheap water for a century um, they don't want to pay for solutions. They don't want to pay more for their water. And it's becoming clear now in the responses to the feasibility study report that many of those water users still don't agree that Scott Dam needs to come out. Um, so we have a real problem because we're trying to build a regional consensus to move forward with this idea. And, um, you know, the folks who are supposed to benefit from it don't seem to want it. So if this plan fails, um, which you know is now a real possibility, then I'm not sure it's likely, it's possible. Um, the, the, the other main route ahead of us, the, the, formal you know, the formal path before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is its surrender process. Um, PG&E would go into that. Um, now there's ways that PG&E could resist dam removal but we think they won't for a lot of reasons, um, starting with the fact that PG&E has effectively renounced its ability to relicense these dams um, and continuing through the very, very serious impacts these dams have on Eel River Salmonids, especially Steelhead and Chinook. Um, and you know, so we think we would prevail um, in that argument. Um, and PG&E, if it has a order from FERC to remove the dam, it can then go to the California Public Utilities Commission, which regulates its rates and is likely to um, be allowed to recover the costs of dam removal plus a standard profit um, for all the money it spends on dam removal. So that looks like a way that um, would get dam removal done. Um, PG&E is you know, going to get paid to do it. And the very high costs that PG&E is bearing right now, five to $10 million a year in operation and maintenance costs alone for Scott Dam, 
mean that it doesn't really have an incentive to just stall and keep the thing in place. It's going to keep costing the company money, which it doesn't have. Um, but there are, there are some real downsides to the surrender process, it's worth noting. Um, all the stakeholders that are gathered in the ad hoc group and the, um, you know, the smaller version, the, the planning agreement group, um, are, would really be outside that process. And we wouldn't necessarily have a, a secure timeline to resolve this, so it could go on forever. So there's another option, um, maybe, which I'm thinking of as sort of version 2.0 of plan A, still trying for a two basin solution that would secure dam removal in exchange for a continued wet season diversion. And one way we could do that would be to redraw the Potter Valley project to take Scott Dam out, leave that in PG&E's lap. They go to FERC for the surrender process. The regional entity gets the rest, um, but they still have to figure out how to get that volitional passage, the ability of fish to move upstream and downstream when they want it at Cape Horn Dam. Um, and we still have to figure out how to pay for it, um, which is a big, big ticket. So, you know, I wanna emphasize that the events of the last five years have basically eroded the already weak position of Scott Dam proponents. Um, it is now very clear that Scott Dam will be removed one way or another. Um, our position at Friends of the Eel River is very clear that Round Valley Indian tribes rights must be secured in any of these resol any such resolution. Um, one of the things we're going to be looking for um, is the principle that those who benefit from the diversion of Yale River water bear the costs. Um, that's particularly important because, you know, this is formally a hydroelectric project, but it loses a lot of money on every um, watt of power it produces. So the water is going to have to pay the, um, pay the freight here. Um, another point is that we're going to need more transparency um, to move forward in this process. We haven't yet seen publicly, for example, the feasibility study report, feasibility study itself. Um, we've only seen an um, executive summary report of that. So we're looking ahead to an additional agreement called the cooperative agreement that's going to be negotiated and signed between um, the planning agreement parties. That's going to resolve many of the questions that are still outstanding. And we're going to be looking ahead for the um, question whether they're able to secure the 10 to $15 million that it looks like will be needed to finish study plans and finish the relicensing process before FERC. Really, the only source for that money is PG&E. So um, there's probably um, a big turning point ahead in the next six months. So stay tuned. Um, it's going to be really interesting.